Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are live and Coast to Coast TV is number 11. Um, I'm operating on very little sleep, so forgive me if there's any slips and slurs or whatever else, but my uh, my co-pilots will carry me through, I'm sure. Um, and we're fighting some technical gremlins on the uh, the guest side, so we'll see if, uh, if we can resolve everything there. But uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for hanging out. Um, we are your fortnightly fast charge on EVs and infrastructure. And uh, we are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, a bunch of other places the day after, audio only. If you want to listen to us on your commute or watch us on the replay on YouTube later on. Um, but today we will jump into uh, the news, which uh, I don't know if we landed on one in the end. I'm thinking what was breaking at the very last minute this morning was... Uh, the Fisker roller coaster, which seems to get uh, different every day, but um, that's the last thing I was reading was a price uh, slash by about half of the uh, the list price. But uh, Fisker, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, released their Ocean EV um, not that long ago, and uh, have been on a bit of a, a roller coaster since then. To put it uh, not uh, too finely, we had. Um, a lot of activity and promotion in February. I actually signed up for a uh, ride and drive, which I was quite looking forward to uh, last week, I think. And then kind of got the vibe that it would be canceled as all the bankruptcy rumblings came along and the uh, potential talks with a large automaker who we pretty much know was Nissan. Mm -hmm. um, and they have pretty much confirmed that bankruptcy is in the uh, wings this week with uh, Nissan and the large automaker for dropping out and uh, a price slash today I was reading as I came up on $24,000, I think, for the Fisker Ocean, yeah. which is a bit of a gamble if you're, uh, you know, it's now the cheapest EV in the United States, but uh, it's also one that may not have any service or parts going forward. So, uh, Eric, what are you thinking on the, the Fisker? Rock? Yeah, I, I mean, I was checking my change drawer to see if I could pick up enough to get a controlling share of the company, but um, I'm a little bit short. Have a quick round, see if we can. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, it's unfortunate because it's. I, I saw them when they unveiled at the Elliott Auto Show initially, and I was I was worried even then, um, but you know it was just i don't i can't even even now articulate what it was about it that just didn't inspire me to like really dig into fisker it just seemed like they there was a lot going on there that maybe they weren't going to make good on on what what they were saying that they were going to do and i i also think that for a startup it's always been hard right like i think we we uh kid ourselves if we don't accept the fact that startups that succeed are the exception not the rule usually you know five or ten to one failed companies and failed attempts um but fisker made it far enough to actually be producing a car so um you know that makes it a little bit more palpable i guess but um i i feel like if you are going to do that i think rivian made the right choice right in that they were going to build a car to go against Tesla and a few other EV automakers. And then they stopped and said, nobody's doing a truck. So like, why are, why are we going to start with the thing that everybody else is doing? And a midsize sedan is the thing that everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're having to catch up from, you know, a race where you already have 10, 20 automakers ahead of you. Yeah. Nissan isn't even really selling the Aria and that's right. kind of an equivalent. Even, uh, the automaker oh. in there is Nissan and uh, the area is kind of just, you know, they were potentially in the, the lead on that kind of segment when they unveiled it in 2020. And then fast forward a couple of years, it's uh, probably the most saturated part of the EV space, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like if Fisker could have won a different direction, maybe they could have inspired a little bit more um, support, but we're running out of those options right now for startups to really, you know, get in it in a niche area in the auto market. So if the brand has a good idea. You don't have to worry about parts. You just buy several of them and you have uh, your own backup parts. <laughs> yeah. them end to end. Plus if you park them end to end about 200 miles out, you get a 600 mile range. So be in good shape. Um, Walter, what are you thinking about the uh, Fisker, whatever it's going to be? It's a bit of a unfortunate 
twist of events that came rather abruptly. I know some good people on YouTube who are producing Fisker content, and there is a fan base there for that. So they definitely have my condolences if this thing does go south because it had <clears throat> a pretty strong following as one of these uh, car companies that was going to be disruptive should the OEMs have decided not to go down the EV route. However, they pivoted faster than people had thought. And in a heartbeat, Ford showed up with the Ford F-150 Lightning. Uh, the Mach-E General Motors is coming on strong. They've retired the uh, Bolt, which was on a previous platform and are all in on Altium. And there's just a slew of Altium cars coming out. Uh, the Volkswagen ID4 was butting right up against the uh, Fisker Ocean. And without something in order to sustain them, Tesla had the advantage of first to market. Lucid, I actually didn't think was going to survive, but the Saudis showed up in order to keep them afloat. And Rivian, similarly, I had my questions about. However, they had the Amazon delivery truck contract to kind of keep the lights going. And now they've got the Canadian Post contract, similarly, to sustain them for many years. So Rivian and Lucid had saving graces, but Fisker had no such luck. And I think without that and the OEMs showing up with a pretty large portfolio and the ability to churn out product onto the market with a vast support structure just really leaves Fisker in a very dire situation. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame because the, the styling on that, the vehicle is nice. I know they had the um, Marquez Brownlee review didn't go well for them. But I think if you look at that, although it was, you know, a headline, um, it did a really good job. You know, I was just saying software is a problem. That's one of the main things. It's a little bit weird with some of the quirks of the car, but software is the biggest piece. And uh, if they fix that, you know, it's... Um, ready to go but there's there seems to be more and more coming out um i haven't read all the reports yet but there's you know uh mismanagement on the financial side by the sound of it in some of these articles i've uh, seen the headlines bubbling up so it does seem like they were uh you know making a ramp there was a really big push i know promotionally um january february but as i say it uh, kind of fell apart the last uh, few weeks and i'm not sure where we'll end up here um but yeah, so I mean, that's not uh, not the brightest um, piece of news to go at, but we are, uh, I'm at the New York Auto Show at the moment, or in New York for the Auto Show, and there's lots of uh, good headlines coming out and plenty of uh, vehicles kind of being revealed or having price, uh, little price cuts to kind of make them more appealing if you're a Polestar, that kind of thing. So did, good I, coming. did I see something under the Hyundai wraps that looked like a pickup truck? Um, it was the Santa Fe. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, I, uh, I was hoping they were going to uh, unveil something special like the Ionic 7, but uh, it was mostly, although they do have plug-in hybrid versions, so it's uh, still electrified if you don't care for that term. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you know still uh, Polestar had some reveals for the uh, Polestar 4, and uh, the price is coming down on that. And the 3, um, uh, Kia won the uh ev6 uh, won the world car of the year award so you know there's some good news coming out it's just unfortunate the fisker i mean it's kind of that uh that difficulty any any auto startup is gonna face problems and as eric kind of pointed out in the world of uh mid-priced almost mainstream kind of crossovers you are not going to be alone so we will put that to bed and hope they uh they kind of come out the other side with some kind of rescue package but at the moment tough yeah, I was going to say it's the, the big unfortunate thing, though, is that this is just more fire for the FUD about EVs failing. So yeah, all the other rounds can be selling as well as they sell. And then Fisker is struggles and now it's, you know, the sky is falling. So, yeah, although I think it would be a bigger deal if someone like Rivian kind of failed. I mean, Fisker's just they barely made a dent already where right? they had to get up to some kind of running speed to even begin to uh make a name for themselves obviously he is a famous individual but uh, as a ev brand and uh current going concern they're not necessarily the biggest uh, fish in the ocean uh let's run through the um yeah i wish i didn't even realize that that's how i sleep i, I can pun even when i'm <laughs> half asleep let's see uh we have um mike mahan 
from SoCal, appreciating British expressions, bits and bobs. Uh, so thank you for hanging in with us, Mike. Uh, Mike's regional network in, uh, just to foreshadow our topic today, would be, uh, let's see, beyond DBGo. I think he also put uh, EVCS, which is yeah. that one that is starting to make some waves over your side, right, Eric? Yeah, and I, I was gonna I was gonna jump in on that and say that I think with regional, it's less about the size of the network and more about where it's located. Right. So you know, if you have chargers across the country, even if you're a small network, you wouldn't really be a regional network. Right, and you have uh, Leonard here kind of uh, epitomizing uh, what I would consider a regional network, Francis Energy, because I think all of us have heard of them, but uh, probably none of us have used them. Um, Soon, maybe they're uh, they seem to be moving out, but uh, definitely the the second largest uh, awards from uh, the Nevi side after Tesla, and uh, definitely a big one over there, kind of Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, that kind of area. Um, so hello, Leonard. Thanks for weighing in. Big Barney's in Western New York, so we'll have some uh, local uh, topics there, and uh, plenty for you to dig your teeth into in a little bit here. Brian Ribby over in Minnesota. Good evening. Uh, Mike Carter in North California for regional again, EBCS. Definitely hear that name a lot. Obviously, I've never used them myself, but Eric, you will be familiar. Uh, let's see, have I missed anybody? Stevenson Pizza up in Maine. He is uh, very close to the first Tesla Nevi supercharger, which I, is on my list to visit once I get back to my stomping grounds of new england hello and congratulations on your two new tesla universal chargers in boxport maine which is becoming a mecca of uh, level two charging for the state of maine and i think that gets me up to almost everybody james rockhill hello uh have you guys checked out vinfast um yeah i guess that would be an ev we call it startup but again i would put that in the category of very deep pockets right walter that would be the kind of Saudi is backing Lucid, while the uh, the Vietnamese money behind Vinfast is pretty substantial, from what I've read in your videos or watched in your videos. Yeah, but it is privately funded. Mm -hmm. So the, the company can stand on its own, but they are definitely heavily extended into electric vehicles, and should for some reason that falter, they would they would be in dire circumstances. So. Uh, They've decided North America will be their primary market to venture into. And there's some questions about the viability of that with a Vietnamese brand, but uh, we will see how it goes. They do have a factory here in North Carolina that's getting built big time. It's a very large parcel of land. I was actually on that property not too long ago. And uh, just the extent of acreage that they're covering is is massive. So. Let's hope they uh, come out the other side with some vehicles that everybody wants to drive around the U.S. Uh, Todd, we have uh, FPL Evolution in Florida. That is not far from your doorstep, Walter, and definitely uh, some lot of rumblings out of Florida and some very big charging hubs. So that uh, is a region that we need to watch, I think. Um, so going back to Big Barney, who has given me the segue that I needed for regional DC fast charging is our topic. That's why everybody's weighing in with uh, folks you might have heard a little bit about, but maybe not have used. That's uh, kind of what I'm um, focused on at the moment because we have uh, New York evolved. And hopefully if I can uh, introduce his, uh, bring him up on stage and hope the mic is doing okay, then we'll check it out right now. John Markowitz, uh, Head of E-Mobility at the New York Power Authority. How is your tech serving you? I hope it's doing oh, better. <laughs> a full reboot Woo. seems to have gotten the trick. So <laughs> welcome to Coast to Coast TVs. Thank you for um, extending your day. You're probably sick of the sound of my voice now <laughs> after hearing it all day, but I'll let Eric and Walter uh, do most of the questioning here. But um, like, you want to give us a little bit of uh, background on yourself and just uh, kind of introduce us to the New York Power Authority for anyone who's not familiar and your uh, your work. Sure, and, and and thanks for having me on, on the podcast. And, and I've I've uh, you know seen a lot of your work and Eric and Walter. I've seen some of your stuff on YouTube too. It's really informative. I think it's doing a real service to like e the EV community uh, to get all this news out there. Um, and yeah, just for some background, um, New York Power Authority is the largest uh, state-owned electric utility in the country. 
Uh, most of the power we generate is our hydropower from Niagara Falls and also the St. Lawrence River. Um, and uh, we supply uh, electricity to a lot of the New York City government buildings, uh, anything from uh, subways to public schools. Um, so we're a large utility, but operating, you know, more on the government side, so not as well known. Um, and we've been active in electric vehicle uh, technology for 25 years. We're one of the earliest utilities in that sector. And most of that time it lived in our R&D department. So we did lots of pilots, like the first hybrid buses in New York, uh, first plug-in hybrids from a major auto manufacturer. Um, first big rollout of level two in the state. Um, so a lot of those kind of things. Um, and then we transitioned the program over to building infrastructure for our government customers. So anything from public charging in a commuter lot all the way up to fast charging. Uh, well, I guess maybe I shouldn't call it fast charging. Transit bus charging. So they're what we could would consider fast charging. Mm -hmm. but when you have a bus with 500 kilowatts of uh, 500 kilowatt hours of battery, it's not really fast so much. It's overnight charging, right? It's all relative um, to the size. Yeah, it's all relative to the size <laughs> of the battery, right? Um, but yeah, we're we're doing all that kind of work as well. Then in 2018. Um, we knew the state was going to be passing climate legislation soon. And there were all these greenhouse gas targets and they were very aggressive. And, you know, we looked at the landscape of EV charging in New York, especially upstate New York. New York's a really large state for those who aren't familiar, like to drive from, say, Long Island to Buffalo, like east west along the longer side of the state. That, that could be a nine hour drive, right, or more. So it's a big state, a lot of territory to cover. And outside of the Tesla network, which was completely proprietary until very recently, um, there was no fast charging north of Albany or west of Albany. And there wasn't all that much from Albany south either. Um, and what there was out there was 50 kilowatts, a uh, single unit uh, at the time, which to me is too slow for the cars we knew were coming based on the intelligence from the automakers um, and also single point of failure right like if that one charger's out that like changes your travel plans right there weren't that many of them and then if somebody else was using it like mass pike you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. like I, i've traveled up and down that several times back in the day when you know you just had these single 50 kilowatt units right and some, like somebody else is using it, there's a second car waiting to use it like on a summer weekend and you're the third person and like, you know, it's 50 kilowatts. So you're going to be there a while. So our vision it was, is, is strikingly similar to Nevi today, except it was back in 2018, mm -hmm. was there really needs to be like four chargers and they need to be 150 kilowatts and maybe even faster. Right. And, and that was our vision of it and make some of the stations bigger if you could get the real estate to do so. Um, so that was our vision, being um, able to have dots along the map. Originally, we said every 75 miles. And then when Nevi came out, it was every 50. Um, but it was the same concept um, and really just populate out the map on all the major highways, but also target places where the private sector would never go. Right. So we knew like you needed to have fast chargers at tourist destinations um, or on the way to them. And some of them are in rural areas in New York State, like in the Adirondacks. But, you know, you needed to have those dots on the map, right? Because people are just not going to buy the cars if they can't get to see their relatives and go to their vacation destinations. So that was our vision to be like the first mover, get the chargers out there, get people comfortable with road tripping in EVs. Um, so we started building it all out. It was tough because that's right when COVID hit. Um, so we had to work up, packages, uh, all that. It was I'll toss up really a picture here just of the first site that you had in uh, LaGrangeville. So it was even yeah. pre-branding there. So I managed to sneak in before the, uh, the marketers got in there. But uh, this was uh, summer 2020, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, and then, yeah, so to fast forward to today, just to show how much work you've done in three and a half years, uh, here's the current map. 
and just kind of emphasizes your point right as we kind of look up to the north there the the loop that you see in the middle of that is the adirondacks kind of right in the center and then uh, you kind of go all the way down to new york city uh there's across the center of the state there in the new york thruway hitting all the major cities buffalo rochester syracuse to albany and even the southern tier covered um so I don't know if you want, I'll leave the map up um, and you can just maybe talk through some of the locations. Is there anything you kind of particularly want to call out any of the locations that you're, you know, really proud of? Yeah, there's a couple of unique ones. Like there's a few of these roadways where we are the only non-Tesla fast charging even to today in 2024. So if you go from Albany up into Quebec, uh, that roadway I-87 going north is called the Northway. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the only charging on that corridor currently. And it's a really important roadway. I mean, we get all sorts of Canadian visitors. Um, we see lots of reviews on plug share in French, so that's how we know. Um, and it's a really important one to serve. Um, same thing is true on that 81 corridor that goes north and south down the middle of the state. Um, there's an EA station uh, around Syracuse that was out there before we built, but otherwise that north-south route. And then that southern tier, it's um, Route 17 and 86. Um, before us, the only thing out there was one EA site in Binghamton, which is sort of in the middle going east to west across the state. Um, so those, you know, roadways are pretty unique. The Taconic Parkway as well as another roadway where we're the only CCS charging. So we're really proud of like enabling charging on all those routes. The other big piece of it is urban charging and we're just getting started on that. Um, our second opening was JFK airport and mm -hmm. we put 10 chargers there. And at the time it was like the biggest non Tesla charging uh, station on, on the uh, East coast with 10 ports. And at the time, I remember hearing people teasing us saying, oh, like, who's going to use that? Like, you have 10 charters. Like, it was unheard of. And at the time, Tesla was building out 12s and 20s. And we thought it was reasonable to build 10 at a major airport. Um, and it took a little while before it started getting used. But now it's absolutely slammed. And it has to do with um, regulations that the city of New York has to electrify the taxis and the rideshare vehicles. So currently there are over 10,000 electric rideshare and taxis in New York and just more and more coming all the time. And of course, they're picking up and dropping people off at JFK Airport. So that cell lot is just precious to them um, to the point where they we had to put in traffic enforcement like, you know, to to just manage the traffic in that parking lot because the queues were growing. So I wish we could have built out 20 in hindsight um, if we had the grid capacity to do so. Um, LaGuardia Airport is in design and we have 13 sites with New York City DOT and these would be municipal parking lots in all the outer boroughs and we're hoping to make most of those six uh, charger sites and it's tricky in New York City because these parking lots are not all that big um, but they're just desperately needed if you want ride share to go electric and apartment dwellers to go electric and it's incredibly challenging to do the urban DC fast charging, but we at least wanted to get our toe in the water and get some of that done. And there, there's some private sector players doing it, like Revel, you might be familiar with, doing electric ride share and then opening their charging hubs to the public. So we just wanted to add to that because there's just so much need. Good. Um, I'm seeing my audio might be too loud or yours might be slightly low, John, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm gonna turn mine down a little bit, see if that works for folks. Mike says the audio is fine, so I'll try and be uh, be a bit quieter. <laughs> um, so yeah, let me open it up to to Eric and Walter because, uh, as I say, I've uh, questioned you plenty, but uh, you guys have uh, some time, and I'll take off the mic here so that I'm quieter. All right. Well, I don't know if you want me to lead in, but uh, yeah, no, John, you you said a lot of stuff that I'm gonna say like, oh. And now I'm loud. <laughs> um, I'm going to say that from a California EV owner's perspective, um, I'm extremely jealous because, you know, speaking of, of regional networks, we have a Caltrans network. It is not good. Um, we're talking single 50 kilowatt 
maybe 125 amp, but more than likely 100 amp BTC power in the rest stops. They break all the time. Um, and there's just a single one of them spread out all over, you know, all over the state. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's a haphazard network. There was no thought put into it whatsoever. No, no thinking about where they should go or where, where they should be supporting. And then outside of that, I, I mean, I don't want to turn this into a contrast of New York versus California, but the only, the other thing is California Energy Commission, uh, they would do grant funding, right? So they would reach out to different network providers and say, hey, can you build these chargers? But some of them were early, so I can forgive it a little bit. But yeah, it's those single 50 kilowatt charging sites that they want you to put in, in a state with 40 million people and, you know, millions of you know, prospective EV customers on the road, and you're putting in a single 50 kilowatt tritium in the back of a building somewhere two miles off the freeway. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and Mike, yeah, chiming in because our Caltrans is just, it, the, the, the network they put together is just not good enough for us. And we still have, even now, um, Electrify America was called before CARB, and they, uh, they had to speak to why there are still sections of California that are completely uncovered. And to your point, going and covering the areas that the private sector isn't going to cover is a key. We still have a 300 mile stretch of scenic highway in California that has zero public chargers. Like how, how, how is that possible? Right? So I'm glad to hear that you did all of that sort of forward thinking and, I've been looking back like in my head, just retrospectively, uh, one thing that I would want to ask you about is um, I know Electrify America made the active choice to not install split power chargers initially. Uh, the ABB units that they used um, did have that DC switching functionality that would allow both cables to be active at the same time. Um, did you ever consider that? And if you did, um, why did you pass on that as an option? Uh, we did install it at one site um, and had some issues with the technology and it would take out two chargers and, you know, we'd send a tech and then it was just easier to deconfigure that, right? For reliability reasons. And it was early days, right? Um, the newest hardware that EA is putting in, as you know, has the power split of, you know, 375 across two units. Um, that does lower the installed cost a bit of what we were doing previously, which was one or two 350s that were independent and then some 175s. So the power sharing is getting a bit better, but, you know, in my opinion, where I think the industry needs to go is a complete mesh kind of system. You know, we have power cabinets and then you could put as many dispensers as you want. Now, the tricky part of that architecture is it's, it's great for reliability and for like matching your site to whatever the grid capacity is. Right. But still not like shortening the number of dispensers to mate with the grid capacity, because we have sites where you know we've designed it for eight. But then when we find out, well, we only have enough grid capacity for four. Right. Right. And then it's a painful waiting game of, okay, do we wait two years for when there's eight? That mesh thing would sort of allow you to do the eight under worst case conditions. Everybody's charging a bit slower. Um, under best case conditions, there's no wait, you know, and the slower cars are fine with it. So that that's how I'd like to see the architecture of these going forward. And then there's a consumer education piece, unfortunately, that like if it's, say, July 4th weekend, and the thing is just slammed with users and right. everybody's charging a little slower than normal. Like you have to explain that to them somehow that like this is only happening because my site's oversubscribed, which is a little right. bit techy. And, and I would say like that's probably the most common complaint we get from users is, oh, I'm charging slow. And it's terribly frustrating as a charge point operator because you have to investigate them and take them seriously because maybe it is your charger is like limping because there's a power module out and you need to send a tech. Right. But a lot of times you'll look at the data and you'll see some user came like 
an hour or two later and got the full rated capacity of the machine. So now you know it's their car or it's the cold weather or preconditioning. There's just a tremendous amount of user education that's needed. And, and like as a charge point operator, sometimes you're like chasing the ghosts of do I need to send a tech and you don't. And oh, the other point you mentioned that's interesting is the California, New York thing. There's some interesting back and forth on all sorts of things, EV charging related between the two states. So California had make ready coverage with the utilities way before New York did. And we lobbied the um, utility regulator to say like, it's maybe time New York has this because otherwise it's so prohibitively expensive to grid connect DC fast chargers to the grid without this make ready coverage where the utilities you know share that cost with you right. so i think that's one point where california was way ahead of us um the one that was sort of interesting where we were in a race with each other was demand charge reform right so demand charge makes a lot of these stations uneconomic and california had done some like pilot demand charge reform then new york did some and now we have something that's i think much more enduring like a more permanent kind of program where demand charge is scaled to your um, utilization. So now you have that site in a tourist destination like the Adirondacks, and you know it's only going to get used seasonally. You pay a much lower demand charge, and then the one in New York City that gets frequent users, you pay the full freight. And I think that's fair to all parties, you know, and it, it makes DC fast charging more interesting for the, for the private sector to jump in. Absolutely. Did you want to jump in, Walter? Yeah. So sadly, I've been compiling questions, and I think I'm up to about nine now. I'm not going to have enough time to ask them all. I'm trying to figure out which one to ask. And you you guys just touched on one of my main one, which is demand charges. For someone like you, John, who's been in the industry as long as you have uh, and has seen this, I'd love to ask this question. So what I've been seeing as of late is charge point operators are clicking – the cost that they're charging customers up and up and up and up. And I think because the uh, era of subsidies is waning and we're venturing into the era of having to make a business model that makes sense. And what I'm hearing is that in order to offset demand charges, they need to do these darn near price gouging levels just to break even. And the demand charge, as I understand it, now you can correct me, but this is a layperson's view, is that because there's an electrical pool of electrons floating across the wires, if all of a sudden you create a whirlpool in that big lake of electrons, it causes ripple effects and disruption. So in order to discourage that, they create demand charges. And I, I might be misspeaking, but just in okay. order to encourage stability of the grid, uh, they try to discourage heavy utilization in any one location. And uh, so it's a protective economic protective mechanism of the back end grid. But I, I'd love to hear because I think this is a, a growing problem because if you're talking 60 cents per kilowatt hour and you do some rough math on that, that's like six bucks for a gallon of gas. And it, it really sours the deal for EV adoption. So I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, in, in terms of demand charges, the way utilities typically explain it, um, is it's the size of the copper serving your site. And it's it's to de-incentivize, and the, the example always used to be a factory, maybe now it should be a DC fast charger, but if somebody builds a factory and it's only running like say two, three hours a day, but at like dozens of megawatts, um, and you put this big fat wire to serve that, but you're only going to, getting so many kilowatt hours out of it to economically pay you back for that investment in that big copper wire. You want to penalize that factory in comparison to the factory that's running 24 seven at the same power rating because you're selling a lot more energy over the same year than the first factory that's peaky. So that's the idea. It's like utilities don't like peaky loads. They like flat, you know, predictable loads and DC fast charging is sort of like the utility's worst nightmare. <laughs> exactly, right? that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an office building, except we could build it in a couple of months. And an office building normally takes a few years. Mm -hmm. So it's also sort of their nightmare from like the logistical build out part of it too. Um, 
I mean, they've been great partners in trying to help us figure out where to put these chargers, where the grid's not going to be overloaded. Um, so that was a big thing. And California was a big part of that. Like they did big maps on solar to show where to put solar, where the grid could support it and where it couldn't. And then we said, well, why don't we do the same thing for EV hosting capacity? So we don't bother the utility and ask about some you know, convenience store on the east side of the highway when the west side is where all the power is. Um, and you know we're, we're agnostic, whether it's on either side. Um, in terms of pricing, we recently had to increase our price. We started the program at 35 cents and we slowly had to creep it up to 40 and 45 cents. Um, we're hoping to hold it there for quite a while. We want it to be affordable. Um, the demand charge is a piece of like the OPEX cost. And I think what we're seeing across the board is now that these faster cars are here and you're getting more simultaneous users, those demand charges are getting much bigger than in the early days when you'd have like one or two bolts, right? And, and a four charger station. And you, you never saw more than a, like a fraction of your, your peak capacity is your demand charge. Now we're starting to see it pretty often, like most months, we're at like maybe two thirds of our peak capacity because of simultaneous users like on weekends and things like that. So that's a piece of it. And I think other operational expense, like just trying to keep the chargers up and running reliably, there's warranty expenses and all that involved. So yeah, it's an unfortunate thing. And what, I, what we're trying to pilot is um, having like a frequent flyer program and i guess the other networks you know like electrify america and all like tesla they have tesla. a member program yep if you go um, yeah we didn't want to do that because we felt like a lot of our users are visitors from other states so we don't want to have a member program like if you're just driving through why should you have to be a member to get a good price um so we've tried to keep the price you know as low as we could and still try to get the program to break even um you know we don't even need to earn a profit, right? We just need to break even as a state entity. Um, so the other thing we're experimenting with is a pilot for our frequent users. So those rideshare drivers, I think are disproportionately affected by the price, right? Because um, they're, they're visiting us regularly, like maybe multiple times a week, right? Out of necessity, because they can't charge at home. This is their job. They're doing a lot of miles. Um, so we're piloting a program where if they behave the way we want them, meaning they leave the charger when they hit 85% and free it up for the next driver, we'll give them incentive points and they could use that towards free charging going forward. So their net effective cost over the month is cheaper. It's like a frequent flyer discount. So we're experimenting with things like that. We're hoping, you know, more folks in industry try to do some creative things to bring the price lower for the frequent users. And I appreciate that. And if I could ask one more sure. uh, follow-up uh, concerning the struggles of getting DC fast chargers in the ground, the National Renewable Energies Laboratory has put out a study saying that there would have to be 180,000 DC fast chargers by 2030 in order for the demand of uh, sales that they're forecasting to be met. Do you see a problem with reaching that goal of 180,000 DC fast chargers in the contiguous 48? Uh, before 2030, because just the sheer, uh, as you say, challenge of getting electrical connections for all these is seems to be the choke point. It, well, there's multiple choke points. That's the big one. Um, others are just appropriate siting, and it's something you guys talk about a lot uh, uh, on your broadcasts, like getting the right amenities, the right distance from the highway, good visibility to the road so it feels safe and you know good lighting. Like all those things are a challenge as well as the grid part. And then the big issue we have, especially in the more urban parts of, of the state, is just real estate, period, right? Like a lot of convenience stores, they have like 15 parking spaces. And if you say, well, I'm going to take six to you know, put in DC fast charging, it's like, well, you know, they still want to cater to the people who are just stopping in to get milk or whatever. So it's a challenge for them to give up the parking spaces, which is, I think, why the Walmarts of the world have charges because they have so much parking. Um, so, yeah, there's multiple challenges. And what's so interesting about the NREL study that we realized early in the program is their modeling is very sensitive to the housing um, population. Right. So if you 
if you do the model for a region of your state that's predominantly single family housing, your number of DC fast chargers is, is like, you know, hugely lower, exponentially lower than when you do it for New York City. Um, and then accounting for things like taxis too just increases that number. So yeah, it, it's going to be a huge challenge for the utility industry, for the fast charging industry. I mean, I hope we're up to it. Thank you. Eric, do you want me to give you some window to jump in? Before well, I... I mean, I I, ha I could I could be here all day, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you. All right. Well, you will be. So let me jump into the comments briefly and uh, let John uh, take some from the, the audience for a little bit here. Um, so Leonard, who is uh, in the center of the country, asks, uh, do you subcontract to EA for most or all of your sites? Since Tesla now appears to be willing to sell superchargers and their NEVI bids are low, would you be willing to buy those? We'd, we'd be open to hearing it, you know, and looking at it. I, the the Nevi bids, I wonder if that's indicative of the actual pricing for somebody who wants to own and operate the chargers like us. Um, my theory, and I don't know this, this is a speculation, but is that, you know, when Tesla puts in the Nevi bids, like, well, A, there's no markup because they're selling it to themselves, the equipment, right? Um, but B, they might be sites they're already planning on doing so they're just asking for cost share right which is very different from say an ev go who needs a lot more cost share right um but yeah it, it's something we'd be open to again it has to be like a full solution hardware software long-term warranty service tech spare parts like all those parts need to be part of a program for it to be successful and to have any decent uptime um so we we'd need to know that Tesla be willing to support like all of that before we we honor it. We we take a serious look at it. I'm a similar tip. Big Barney is just uh, <laughs> baffled by the uh, the sheer efficiency and uh, of their cost. But again, that's them making it. They come out of Buffalo, so you know, close to home again. But well, they plus are... they're not Navy compliant. Well, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, third and... rail of EV charging right now. That well, uh, and lower power per stall too. So like when you, when you actually put the numbers together, price per kilowatt, uh, Tesla is pretty much in line with the rest of the market. And on the, the hardware's uh, provider that we're all kind of excited about, Kempower, um, any, any thoughts on uh, them now that they're kind of moving into the, the US market more, John, have you considered their equipment, satellite sites, that kind of thing? Uh, we have not, I have not yet seen one or tested one. Uh, I'm intrigued by it. I'm happy they're building them in the States as, as well as some other European manufacturers that are getting set up here. Um, but yeah, I mean, right now, you know, all our rollouts been with Electrify America. Uh, we own and operate it, but you know, they're building it out for us and they had the most experience at the time we were out for bid. Um, and we wanted to get some uniformity of hardware and even using Electrify America, that's been a challenge because they've moved from third gen to fourth gen hardware. Um, but at least it's the same phone app for the majority of our sites. Like our earlier sites are on EV Connect mm -hmm. and we're using different hardware. So we can't even say like all our sites have the same app. We're trying to make the user experience as consistent as possible, but it's been a huge challenge just because the industry is changing so much. And yeah. I wouldn't want to rule out somebody like Kempower if their unit's solid and it's good. We definitely consider it for some of the later installs in the program. Uh, Big Barney has uh, on your demand charges point. We covered batteries a little bit today, but uh, there is a site up in Utica, um, which is a free wire, a couple of free wire units. Um, that we touched on earlier you're saying it's mainly uh because the site has limited power but also because it's not one of those travel sites right it's not coming people could get off the interstate and use it but they're mainly going to downtown utica maybe you could speak to that site a little more yeah i mean i, I have two big concerns about using batteries with dc fast chargers uh first one is just real estate like we're already struggling just to find host sites that'll give us you know five it takes us our minimum site like four chargers it's five parking spaces because you make one extra wide for ada reasons right so you're using five parking spaces 
Then you have all the power cabinets, the switch gear, all that takes up significant space. The more rural sites, there's there's a grassy area that they'll allow you to occupy for all that, and that's perfect. But when you get to the more urban sites now, you're at, you're like taking double the number of parking spaces because you have to find some home for that, and that's the only space available. Um, so add that onto that now a battery that's the size of all those power cabinets or bigger. That becomes problematic just from the real estate point. Um, Second part is if it's one of these stations that gets back to back to back users like JFK, my big worry is, okay, you're going to expend all your battery capacity and you have a very you know, thin pipe coming in and a fat pipe going out. You know, it's, it, how do you explain that to users that like, well, normally I'm on 150 kilowatt charger today. I'm only 25 because that's the size of the pipe and my battery is expired. Um, but yeah, for certain key sites like that Utica site, that was the only way we could serve that site, right? Was to put in the free wire unit. So it was a good solution for that purpose. And, you know, based on its current usage patterns, we've never hit that worst case scenario that I mentioned where the site's tapped out, we're only giving the user 25 kilowatts. It hasn't happened yet and hopefully it won't. Yeah, I mean, I think about my travels up there and I'm always hitting Albany, and Syracuse because that's exactly what you say they're right off the interstate and you know I'm not gonna drag myself five miles down to Utica just to uh to use well, I might do that but most people normal people would not <laughs> thousands wouldn't um so uh, catching up here uh Leonard has one more question um I've heard utilities make DC fast charging cost prohibitive on pricing in some areas how does NIPA handle pricing electricity for high power charges yeah, I mean, we felt really strongly going in, pricing had to be kilowatt hour based. Like we'd seen a whole bunch of charge point operators doing hourly and also session fees. And we felt both of those were discriminatory towards people with the older EVs, right? Because um, there's that many less kilowatt hours, right? Um, that you're getting at that, that for that hour or for that session. So we has to be strictly kilowatt hours and it's such a good analog for gasoline right where you're just paying by the unit of energy um and you know we started at 35 it's creeped up to 45 you know for the reasons we just spoke but you know th th those are our feelings about it and like yeah the demand charge thing is the real pain point that's driving a lot of that and you know, other states don't have the demand charge reform, right? So I think that's why you're starting to see, you know, even places in the Midwest where, you know, DC fast charging is unfortunately prohibitively expensive because the operator is just trying to break even of those demand charges. And it, it's got to be hard for a private sector operator to see these months where, you know, you look at your demand charges, you average that out to the kilowatt hours dispensed, and you see a number that's higher, like your cost, your wholesale cost of the electricity is higher than what you're charging your end users. So you know you're bleeding that month. It's got to be just, just a brutal thing. And, you know, we've seen it on our chargers in some of the earlier days. And now that utilization's picking up, it's better. So hopefully, like once utilization picks up, there is some downward pressure on all this because you can right it's it's all about you know kilowatt hours per month is, is really the whole game on dc fast charging we've had that recently where the the report all the data from stable auto in some of these areas was showing you know 15 20 percent utilization north of that they were starting to make money and as this becomes a profitable business that moves into walter's uh, you know extensive coverage of this is just a private investment at this point it's a business decision not only do you make money on the charging but you start to make money on people coming into that facility and wanting to use it yeah i think there was an auto line daily report that said 30 percent utilization is the tipping point yes. and average utilization had crossed that as of late and so there's apparently some belief that we're now in a profitable um environment the the 30 percent is where you need to build more chargers or another site down the road because now at 30 percent you end up with the, the queuing issue which we're having all over especially peak weekends and things like that so yeah 30 percent sort of that magic number you know where the station's profitable but you're also annoying some of your users 
unfortunately. Interesting. Very interesting. But uh, this is uh, some praise. Let's uh, get some positive notes here. Um, Drehab says, thank you for all the electric vehicle work you are doing. Uh, definitely agree with that. As a frequent traveler all across Adirondacks and across the throughway, uh, I've utilized a lot of Evolved New York sites and very valuable to me and my family. So thank you for that. Um, and Ron specifically in your answers now, uh, John is giving such thoughtful answers. Great to hear. So yeah, it is uh, very good to have uh, kind of, you know, that level of perspective to see, because we're all using these, you know, everybody has um, experience with these fast charges, but I don't know that we necessarily unless we really do get into this kind of uh, you know deep discussion um cognizant of all the pieces that are going on behind the scenes the sheer amount of work that is um is happening behind there so we do thank you for that um eric you've been stoic in your patience let me mute and uh, you can crack on again oh man i so so many but uh one that and i and i actually did see someone mention it um because in this this is maybe more informative because you are partnered with electrify america with a lot of your installations but have you been tracking your actual charger uptime and w do you think it meets or exceeds like the nevi standard of 97 percent which you know we we won't get into because i personally don't think that that's even good enough for a four charger installation um and uh yeah and with that maybe integration issues uh credit card readers versus um you know using the app are you seeing any failures maybe that go beyond the hardware as well but um just in terms of just the overall reliability of your network um if you have that data and and where you feel you stand we we track it really closely and we keep our vendors accountable with these site level um, service level agreements um just to make sure that we're dispatching technicians quickly the most common points of failure, um, like cables and connectors, those are all are mandated in our program to be stocked locally. And we learned this early in the program, like the hard way. Um, so you'd find out like, okay, the, the cable's broken or uh, the chiller on liquid cooled cable, something like that is broken. Oh, we need to get another one from Europe and it's working its way through customs and you should have it in two weeks. And like, we can't be down two weeks. There's so few fast chargers in the state. Right. So you know, we started putting the, the contractual requirements to be stricter and stricter to get the uptime higher through all those measures I mentioned. And local technicians, like, you know, we were flying technicians in from California. I mean, that's, you just can't keep doing that, right? They have to be locally based and factory trained. So like we've brought all those pieces forward to make things better. Um, that said, our uptime is below the NEVI standard for most of the network. Um, some of the newer sites are above. Um, okay. And now that we're actually receiving NEVI uh, for a portion of our network, we're taking it really seriously. Like we want to get to that 97 and get reimbursed for our costs. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a key point on credit card readers. Um, definitely a pain point. A lot less user success using credit card than phone app. Uh, phone app payments are uh, two and a half times greater than credit card users, which is good. I think that's improving our plug-in success and our plug share scores and all our customer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, plug-in charge is still a fairly small percentage of our transactions, I think about 10%. And I'd love to see that be most of them because I think the plug-in success will get better, especially once that technology improves. and it. it it sort of bothers me how long it's taking the automotive sector to offer that. Like that should just be standard on every car, right? You have to get the message across that like this is easier than gasoline. And if you're in the rain fiddling with a credit card reader, you're not sending that message. But if you plug in and the, you know, the car says hello, like the charger says hello, it has your name, has your payment credentials, that's what we need. Okay, that's good. And and so you you would say then those those SLAs you think maybe had the biggest impact on your uptime? That, the local stocking of the parts, local technicians, um, all of those items it make a huge, huge difference. All right. Thank you. Uh, you're inspiring lots of questions, John. So I'm going to make sure I keep going back to the uh, live chat because I'm notorious for getting behind. 
Um, so Jed asks, will Niper enter into level two charging at parking lots, destinations, or stick to DC charging deployment? That does uh, bring me on to a, a useful one because we were going to uh, talk about sort of the urban charging, but also the uh, the level two for uh, you know various. You've got all kinds of irons in the fire with fleets, um, the cities. Uh, a lot of apartments, of course, densely populated, the most densely populated city in the country with New York. Um, so, yeah, I guess take that wherever you want it. But uh, level two, what yeah, do you think? We still have quite a bit of level two, but not under the Evolve network. So the Evolve network is is what we own and operate. And it was specifically to address that pain point of there's nowhere near enough DC fast chargers, right, to travel. Um, for level two, our position is very different. It's that we have a lot of customers that are interested in owning and operating level two, mostly as an amenity towards their visitors or for use on their fleet or their employees use, right? Um, so we've been active in installing that for them. So one, one noticeable example would be uh, New York City DOT. So they operate 6,000 parking spaces in their off street parking lots all around the city. And they have a goal for electrifying, and I always get the years mixed up. 20%, and I can't remember which year, I think it's 2025, which would be 1,000 level twos. Um, and then 40%, I believe it's 2030 or 2035. So it's like thousands of level twos. So like all those apartment dwellers, those taxi drivers, they'll have a place to plug in overnight. It's, you know, so so we're involved in some of those kind of programs, but those are all owned by somebody else. And, and we're basically out um, doing the procurement and the engineering on their behalf. Right. No, that makes sense. But I, I've certainly seen uh, even from the early days that, um, you know, before I could fast charge and when I was maybe stopping overnight, the uh, the number of options for level two in New York uh, were far ahead of what we had in Massachusetts or on the other side in Pennsylvania, Ohio. Um, so New York's always been ahead of that. I'm not sure. I think some of it was the government agencies, certainly. Um, so that, again, is just one of those areas that you've kind of been a little bit ahead of the curve on, um, you know, all charging needs, really. Um, let's see. Anthony asks, does NIPA have dwell time median averages per session? Have charging session times gone up or down over the past couple of years as car capabilities have improved? Uh I had just seen this data, what was it, like maybe yesterday. Um, I think our average session is something like 35 kilowatt hours, uh, which is more than it used to be. The KW rate um, on the charger is definitely significantly going up. Um, so, you know, again, more of those faster cars. Um, dwell time is a mixed bag. Um, I haven't seen that going down but i think it's you know just a mix probably on average it's probably shrinking but not like markedly so yeah that would uh, be both of us actually if you look over my shoulder i think you were one of the models for the uh you had different um kind of settings there was the apartment dweller the uh yes. the road tripper and it looks like you are the road tripper in your the road tripper. that was Sorry. our 100th charger <laughs> celebration because it's stewart's in skodak <laughs> oh there you go again good ice cream You've probably this been is, there yeah i'm i am to stewart's shop's ice cream as walter is to bucky's brisket sandwich we are <laughs> actively seeking sponsorship for that stuff <laughs> um <laughs> Let's see, Silver Surfer, who is uh, definitely in my region because he mentioned one of my charges, uh, local charges. Uh, does Niper have plans for drive-through charges? Um, I'm not sure if, well, you can take that where you want it, but yeah. uh, what would you consider that to be? It is tremendously challenging from a real estate point of view to do drive-through charging, which is why you see so little of it. Definitely needed. You think of that user who's towing a boat to the lake or whatever, you know, it's necessary. Um, and uh, it's escaping me the exact number, but I think we have four sites. So out of, out, out of 40, you know, so it's not a big percentage, but um, they do support pull through. Um, and the newest one that's also a Nevi site, um, North Hudson, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, between Albany and Montreal um that one is pull through charging 
I had uh, seen that actually. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued to go up there. I don't think I'll make it this trip because it's just too many miles in this this week. But um, it's one of those that seems it's uh, it kind of brings us on to your Nevi funding, but also it has more charges than your average um, location. It has Tesla superchargers there. This location for folks who aren't familiar is a little bit north of Albany, which is mid um, mid state, and uh, North Hudson kind of is the what they call the gateway, I guess, to the Adirondacks. Um, so you're you're looking at a lot of camping up there, a lot of people who may be towing boats, I'm guessing, for Lake Champlain or heading off into the mountains with uh, large trucks, that kind of thing. Um, and that does seem like a, a very versatile site. So obviously, you've got a lot of space to work with, but with the, the superchargers up there, plus your locations, um, that's been one of those that is probably going to be catching the eye once people start to uh, visit, I think, this spring and summer. Yep, and that, it's a brand new restaurant uh, facility they're building there, and we haven't even done the ribbon cutting yet because they're opening that restaurant facility like pretty soon. So we can invite you to that ribbon cutting. Hey, yeah. You know, so we opened it to the public, but didn't do the big ceremony yet. Got gotcha. you, Walter. You want to come up and uh, <laughs> make a trip all the way up I ninety five and then swing up a little bit further. Grab I've got some sandwiches. No, I love brisket, man. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> try it before you knock it, man. They, they are like it's like butter meat it's so good um but i do have a couple of things if i could launch back you mentioned 2018 was basically when things got a started and as i understand the storyline here california new york were formulating uh emission regulations which kind of spurred on the need for increasing uh electric vehicle charging for non-teslas and things started to expand and the goal was to have some moment of truth where private enterprise started to get involved and things like that and by my reckoning we're here i mean the number of locations of companies that are now have a dc fast chargers announced i have in front of me at least from my uh own reckoning and it's a pretty long list just recently uh, British Petroleum inaugurated a pretty large site in Houston, and Shell is saying they're shuttering gas stations to go EV. I mean, if that's not a flashpoint or a moment of truth, I don't know what is. I mean, Shell uh, and British Petroleum basically both almost simultaneously getting religion on how to go EV in order to, I guess, survive or something. So what is your thought about the um be careful what you wish for because you might get it approach and all of a sudden a private enterprise showing up and adoption increasing beyond capacity and concern about as you say oversubscription and this whole thing actually getting used and you know the the, the plan actually working uh, there's a lot there so to me like the more people in the pool the better like our goal always was to be the first mover to get ev adoption started and then hope the private sector would jump in and then take over because I mean we're an electric utility. It's 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 not in our core business to build fast chargers, own them, operate them. It, this is like the only thing that New York Power Authority does that really touches end consumers, right? Um, uh, except maybe like we we also operate the canals, right? So it's like a boating, you know, type destination, tourist destination. But like that's it, right? Basically, we're an electric utility, so. Um, so no, get the private sector jumping in is, is the best thing for everyone. And, um, from a regulatory point of view, we're required at some point to divest of the fast charging network. It was just meant to be like, um, you know, a bridge to the future when exactly like what you're saying, the private sector operators, the fueling providers, they're all in DC fast charging. Um, so it's really meant to be a seed to get the, the whole thing going. Well, congratulations. It worked. Right. <laughs> so, and I, I was surprised, Steve, we made it all this way before we had a comment about, uh, yes. Yeah. SAE so, J3400. <laughs> yeah. J3400 SAE. Um, but yeah, just also in terms of, I know Steve, you turned me on to this at Evolve had a CCS one adapter for Tesla's pretty early on. So just, that would be my question for you too, is also just specifically, not just about the transition to J3400, um, but also your 
acceptance of adapters and openness to people doing what they need. Like we're, we're seeing a CCS one to Chatamo adapter that's now hitting the market for Nissan Leaf owners. So just your, your thoughts on that um, in terms of users end users using adapters and that transition to a, a new universal SAE standard. Uh, the new standards are a great thing for the whole industry in my opinion and long overdue I, I was actually in the room many many years ago at the sae committee meetings when tesla like walked away because like you know they wanted to talk about dc fast charging way before the other oems did um you know that said the adapters make me a bit nervous because it's wild west and you know i could totally imagine a scenario where a poorly made adapter welds itself to a vehicle a charger or worse, injures a person, right? Flames, whatever. Um, so we are planning to have, you know, the same kind of policy like EVgo, Electrify America, like only automaker approved adapters can use this. It's, it's a hard thing to enforce, but that's the policy that we're going to have. Um, and, and you just have to, and until these things are certified by some official body to say, this one's safe, it won't cause any problems, you know? Um, and yeah, go, going back to when, you know, we, we put in those adapters on a string, basically, sort of like, you know, the, the pens at a bank that are on a string. Um, we did that because we noticed there were certain holes in Tesla's network in New York State. And if we were building there strategically to say, well, we're going to fill this hole, and Tesla was the majority of EVs in the state, like, well, we have to support them, too. We're not just supporting the other OEMs. Um, so we'll put an adapter there that, you know, a loaner adapter people could use to support um, the other cable standards. So that was our thinking with that. Um, going forward that now everybody's adopting the NAX cable. Um, it's going to be a slow phase, right? So, you know, first this, the Chatamo cables will end up coming out. They'll get replaced with NAX. Then the CCS ones at a later date. And we're just waiting for... Um, the UL approved NAX cables to start coming out that we could retrofit to the older chargers. And then some of the newer installs will start supporting NAX towards the end of the program. And these are cables that you keep locally so they can be quickly replaced. <laughs> no, no, we're shipping them in from Timbuktu. Oh, yep. the prime source for the J3400 standard. Um, <laughs> Brian reminds us to hit like. That's always a good one. I always forget. So uh, if you go into your YouTube uh, app or wherever you are watching, please hit like and uh, let us know that uh, this was useful to you. Um, I don't want to cut Walter off because I know he probably has a long list. Do you want one more question on charging, Walter, before we move on to uh, EV adoption in New York? I also want to be conscious of John's time because he has another media day tomorrow. <laughs> I've noticed in the Charlotte metropolitan area, DC fast chargers in lower income areas are generally not vandalized at all. Uh, there's a town to the north of Charlotte called Salisbury, which is notoriously low income, high crime, and they recently put in DC fast chargers. And it seems like those get quickly assimilated as a asset for the community. And the lower income people who EVs actually are beneficial for because you can you can work out a way of life where an EV lifestyle is actually beneficial if you're lower income. Um, and very little, are you seeing little vandalism on your DC fast chargers and they kind of become a community asset uh, in lower income areas? Because underserved communities are definitely a topic for NEVI and the alternative fuel corridors. So, yeah, we, we calculated recently the number of sites that are in disadvantaged communities and it was higher than we thought. And, and you know, we were, citing them based on transportation needs and then later on finding oh well that's actually a disadvantaged community um the really interesting intersection with disadvantaged communities and dc fast charging is the rideshare fleets and i wish i remembered the statistics but i heard them at some conference recently that the majority of rideshare drivers live in disadvantaged communities the majority of their fares are going into disadvantaged communities and a lot of disadvantaged communities are um, like mass transit deserts in your bigger cities so rail doesn't get out there so people are taking the rail to some point and then ubering the rest of the distance so 
um, there definitely is an overlap between DC fast charge. And maybe that's why like there's no vandalism. It's like, no, protect that because the guys who live here use that thing. And that, that's like their living is that. Yeah, machine. exactly. I mean, it's... That, that, that's my speculation, but I would imagine. Uh, excellent. I think we are primed to discuss a little bit about the actual vehicles that are using your chargers. Um, obviously, we're at the auto show, and there's uh, a lot of new models kind of being unveiled or uh, touted. Um, but adoption in New York has typically is a little bit ahead, I think, of uh, it's not California levels, but certainly uh, we have slightly higher than the national average. Um, how is that? influenced your plans if at all i mean obviously you wanted to get out ahead of this but um do you keep close track of the numbers through your ny Serda colleagues you're looking at the rebates there of two thousand uh, dollars per vehicle um depend up, up to two thousand dollars i should say off at the state level that's before the federal uh kind of credits how is is new york looking in terms of ev adoption it's it's good we're better than the national figure but you know like again nowhere near california and i think some of that is you know california has the hov lanes and all that that we don't really have to offer in new york there's basically like one hov lane in the whole state in long island and and hybrids get access to that so you know we're missing that incentive that i think was huge for california um but yeah I, i'd love to see it just accelerate and do way better i mean to hit our carbon targets it has to be much better than it is but yeah, our colleagues at NYSERDA track it very closely and they're managing the whole rebate program. And, and that said, there are like little hot spots if you do a heat map. And on NYSERDA's website, they have this heat map of EV adoption. And you could dr like drill down to individual zip codes. And some are like the usual suspects, like the richer zip codes. And, you know, you have a high number of Teslas and all that. But then there are other like surprise ones. Um, like university towns that are necessarily like what you think of as wealthy, but like just these hot spots of EV adoption or places where people are, you know, greener than most. And you'll see these hot spots around the state. I was actually, they have some great data there. I'll uh, put it in the, for anyone who follows the replay or the, uh, the audio, I'll put the link to uh, the uh, NY Serda um, data down in the uh, comments and the descriptions, but they had, um, they were looking at who got the rebates, which dealerships uh, applied for them. And, and I think it was broken down by model as well. So obviously Tesla Model Y, you know, best selling vehicle in the world, second best selling in the US is, is top. And I think the Model 3 was close, but the third was uh, Toyota. Um, and I'm sure that can't be the BZ4X because that, you know, I haven't seen that many of them on the roads. Um, so I'm assuming that's because the the rebates also embrace plug-in hybrids and maybe there's the Prius and the RAV4 Prime and some of those must be going into that that side. Yeah, exactly. But there's a lot of interesting data down there. It's definitely worth a deep dive and I'm feeling Walter might be uh, heading that way right after the show. <laughs> it's um, great. The data visualization's stunning. Mm -hmm. You know, heat maps um, on everything, like level two chargers, where the DC fast chargers are, all sorts of useful stuff. We use it all the time. Yeah, fabulous. Um, so we, we're on the last stretch here. Um, I'm just going to open it up to you guys, Eric and Walter. Is there anything you want to cover? Do you want to jump in? We've got the New York Auto Show, obviously, there, EV adoption in New York, or we can just kind of use the last five minutes, 10 minutes on uh, DC fast charging. What do you think? Well, one question I had, but you kind of already answered it, John, because you said you're not really doing level two, is uh, with the space constraints of New York, are, are you showing any interest in wireless charging? Uh, not that I've seen. Um, we've seen curbside charging is a unique flavor of, of level two. Um, and um, our colleagues at Con Ed, the you know other utility in the New York City area, they, they've been doing a pilot with the city on that. I, I find that really intriguing. Um, but no, I mean, wireless charging, you have to have the vehicle that'll interface with it. I mean, it's something we're piloting on the transit bus side of things. There are certain um, you know, bus waiting areas where it makes sense. Um, but then even for efficiency reasons, like in New York City, we're doing pantograph style charging, you know, for those who aren't familiar, that's where you have the robotic arm that comes down and mates with the top of the bus. Um, 
it's a bit more efficient than wireless, but there, there are certain applications like at airports where wireless makes a lot of sense because um, their stopping time is uncertain. Like a transit bus, you know, the driver gets a, a break of a certain period. Um, so having some kind of wired or, or robotic charging makes sense, right? Um, in an airport, you might have like a employee shuttle that like has a very erratic schedule. So having wireless charging, because it might sit there for 10 minutes, it might sit there for 30 seconds, sort of makes a lot of sense. So we're piloting that at two of the airports in the state. Okay. Yeah, I think LaGuardia is next up, right? You mentioned JFK has the 10. Um, sounds like LaGuardia is 12, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so there's um, there's obviously the need there. We've seen the uh, the troubles in Chicago when rideshare drivers pile into um, to limited number of stalls. And I think you actually mentioned that you have um, a traffic cop now down at JFK to JFK. manage the the lines. And um, yeah, so that shows the uh, the kind of to Walter's point, the success or a, you know a factor of your own success is uh, having to manage all those uh, drivers. Um, Okie dokie. I think we are pretty much at time. Um, thank you, John. I really appreciate you uh, making the time. I know they've got lots to uh, to be getting on with. So um, I look forward to kind of catching up again tomorrow. But um, yeah, uh, anything else you guys want to cover before we head off here? <laughs> I do question. You mentioned how... The Nevi plan and the New York plan are very similar. And New York is very well known for kind of sending people south to DC. And I wonder, do you, do you think there's any correlation between how the Nevi plan was formulated from people who came from the New York plan, kind of cross pollinating to the federal government? And basically, the evolved New York was the origins of the Nevi? He's speculating if I if I answered that to the affirmative, it's possible. It, it just sounded too uh, much of a coincidence, but it it seems like it may, there may have been someone, but I don't know. I thought it may have been. It, it's possible there were some people in New York government that did go to the federal government, so it, it's completely possible. But not no nobody reported back to me that. that was the so it's I just assumed that... it was people just watching the industry and where things were going. Well, understood. It's interesting you mentioned that as a head start with Evolve New York because Ohio kind of made the same point. I don't know exactly what their plan was. I wasn't quite as close to that, but they certainly were making the point that their um, you know, their plans were already in place. They had a, an idea of where they wanted these charges to go, so it helped them out. But um, it's interesting that those are the states that kind of, you know, did a lot of work ahead of time and uh, knew where they wanted to go. Um, yeah. So very final question here, I promise, because everybody loves canopies. Um, are there plans for shelters at every site for the equipment and for protection? And it would be for Walter's benefit because he is a big uh, canopy follower. I am too. And it, it is so hard. Um, especially in the Northeast, right? You, you have to design it for wind loads that are, are, are some of the highest in the nation because we don't get hurricanes often, but we do get them. Um, you have to design them for very heavy snow loads as well. Um, so they're pretty expensive. Um, not every site will accommodate them. Not every permitting authority will allow you to put them in. Um, and it pains me to say all that because as a user, having stood out in the rain or the snow and using a fast charger and like almost everybody in our group drives EV. So like we all desperately want to put them on. Um, but it's been a challenge. I, um, we're hoping to make an announcement soon about one of the sites where we engineered it for a canopy. And we're just waiting to get all the approvals on the permit side. We have budget to build that one with a canopy and that'll be our showpiece. So we'll have at least one. You um, mentioned those yeah, folks coming about. down from Quebec and Ontario. They are suddenly going to rally in French. Why don't American chargers have canopy? <laughs> so at the very least, the North Country and maybe Buffalo. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, again, thank you so much. Uh, I think we have a few comments in here just uh, pretty much echoing that. Thank you, John, from Anthony up in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, a plea from Mike in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
Okay, you guys are leading. I, so, uh, we're we're beyond help. <laughs> too far gone to help. And uh, thank you, yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Brian. Um, great stuff. Really appreciate it as always. And uh, we, yeah. We'll uh, have this up as a replay tomorrow. You can uh, dig back into John's answers for all of the gold, and um, we will see you in the next one. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks so much. For Thank you, John. Take care. Thanks.